Berkeley. The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The proceeding. discuss the working culture at ITV. Last week, we heard from ITV's Director of Strategy, uh, Policy and Regulation, Magnus Brook, as part of the evidence that we were taking into the draft media bill. But of course, at that stage, we didn't feel it was appropriate to discuss this issue because it was really important we had the opportunity to scrutinize that bill in full. Uh, and so, but we did feel it was appropriate to have a separate session to talk about the working culture at ITV. And I'm grateful to you all for uh, offering us this opportunity to come in separately. So today we're joined by Dame Carolyn McCall, ITV's Chief Executive, alongside Kevin Ligo, Managing Director for Media and Entertainment, and Kyla Mullins, General Counsel and Company Secretary at ITV. You're all very welcome. Before we start with our questions, I thought it might be helpful for me to set out our approach today. Firstly, you'll all, I'm sure, appreciate that since we announced that we were going to do this session, both I and I'm sure members uh, across this committee have been <coughs> inundated with stories from people about their treatment when working in the media and their concerns. And we, we clearly don't have the, the manpower or the resources to investigate uh, every single one of these individual cases, but I just want to put on record how grateful we are to everybody who's been in touch and to reassure them that the questions that, they, that we asked today will have been informed by quite a lot of what they, what they told us. Uh, secondly, while it's inevitable that many of our questions today will link to Philip Schofield um, and directly to the case that he's been involved in. We do fully intend to try and respect the privacy of the other individual involved. I know that ITV have been referring to him as person X within your correspondence. The point of today's session is not a witch hunt. Uh, against Philip Schofield, it is to investigate the wider issues that are raised by this case. And uh, finally, 
Shortly after we invited Dame Carolyn to appear before us, ITV announced an inquiry into the Schofield case. We've received the terms of reference for that on Monday and we've published them on our committee's website yesterday. We don't expect that this inquiry will be a barrier to ITV answering any questions today because we are seeking information that should already be available to uh, the panel. Okay, before we start the questions, uh, I'm going to ask any members if they have any interest to declare. I should start in that my father was a presenter of ITV for very many years. I'm a former ITV employee. Yeah, I'm a former ITV employee. I've accepted hospitality from ITV in the past. I've been to ITV events over the, over the years and I'm a former uh, news anchor for ITV. I've accepted hospitality over the years from ITV as well. And if we're doing that, I have as well. Uh, yeah, I went to dinner. <laughs> I don't know how far we're going back, but I'm not sure if I have or not. <laughs> I'll declare it. Yeah, today. So we're just going to move on. Thank you very much. Um, Dame Carolyn, since the story emerged about the relationship between Mr Schofield and the junior employee on his programme, there has been a very common theme in response to uh, from figures in the entertainment world, including some current and some former presenters on ITV. So, for example, Piers Morgan said, and I quote, everybody at ITV knew what was happening. James Haskell said, I knew about this, everyone knew. Kevin Maguire said, we had all heard the rumours. Can I just ask you from your vantage point as the chief executive, at ITV, do you class yourself in the in the category of the vast majority of people who seem to know what was going on, or are you telling us that everyone else knew what was going on, but somehow you and perhaps Holly Willoughby were the only ones who did not know? Uh, yes, um, Chair, if you don't mind, I'd just like to say thank you very much to, for inviting me in here uh, and my colleagues. Um, we've taken these issues extremely seriously, as I hope you know. Um, we're particularly glad that we're talking about duty of care in some detail, we look forward to that, and our culture. Um, in every company I've ever worked for, uh, and this is my track record, I've put people <coughs> at the centre, I've always treated people well, I've always wanted people to come into a place where they feel comfortable, where they can speak up, where they can speak out, where they can be themselves, and where they're happy to come to work. Um, we, one of the reasons we asked the KC to come in and look at this, the whole thing, is because we will always want to learn, to listen, to act. Uh, so whatever emerges from the KC inquiry, we will learn from it, because there will be lessons. No, no organization can do anything perfectly, uh, and we certainly are not saying we have. Um, I think the KC coming in kind of demonstrates our commitment to improving and involving everything we do at all times. Uh, a good example of that is actually duty of care, where since 2018, since I joined actually and we reviewed it, uh, we've strengthened it significantly and we will talk about that in some detail today. Another reason uh, goes to your point about uh, what, who knew what. Uh, another reason for, for welcoming this is that there are huge numbers of uh, opinions, uh, there's speculation, there's rumours, there's misinformation out there. And uh, we look forward to making clear the facts that we know. Uh, so uh, thank you again. I'm just going to go straight to your question about the common theme. The people that have said they knew would only have heard rumours about it. If any one of the individuals you have named or referenced had come to us and said there is evidence that there is a relationship between Philip Schofield and Person X, we would have, with evidence, we would have been able to, to launch a formal investigation um, because the imbalance of power, uh, the imbalance in, 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 in of dynamics in that relationship makes it deeply inappropriate. And we have policies that say that very clearly. And so one of the things you, I hope, will see as we go through this is that we worked very, very hard for many, many months, in fact, you know, until recently, to ask people, not just Philip Schofield and Person X, but people in production, if they had if, if, if they knew something was going on. 
and it was repeatedly denied by both individuals, but also no one in the team ever said there was any, anything that they could say. In fact, most of them said, we don't know what's going on. When did you first, personally first become aware of these rumours? I really became aware of those rumours when Philip came out in February 2020. That, that's when, that is the first time things got really febrile. Uh, social media was awash with, I mean, some extremely nasty comments about Philip, as you'd expect, but also um, just a whole swathe of things about him as a person and his being, you know, how, how, how you know, just, there was a lot of speculation and rumor out there. So in February 2020 um, is when Kevin and I spoke about it and we actually, we, we actually started looking at it in December 2019, but it ramped up considerably. The, the, the kind of noise out there ramped up in 2020. What you're basically saying is, like the vast majority of people uh, within ITV, you were aware of the rumours about this relationship, but following investigation you, uh, that you were carried out and the denials that you received from all parties, you were satisfied yeah. that the rumours were entirely false, false. is that well, correct? What I'm saying is that I, I don't know if it's the vast majority of ITV. You've named three or three people, I think, high profile individuals who say they knew. If they knew, why didn't they say something to Kevin? Kevin has conversations with all of those people as talent all the time. So number one, I don't know if it's the vast majority of ITV people. I don't accept that. It, 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 it certainly doesn't feel like that to me, right? The second thing is, in February 2020, it was hard to miss the amount of coverage about Philip when he came out. And therefore, I obviously knew in social media in particular that there was a huge amount of uh, comment about him being gay, how long had he been gay, uh, how long has he lived a lie, uh, you know, there, there were all sorts of aspersions that crossed over to his brother. There was a lot of very, very horrible stuff out there. And I think I, we said we need to just establish whether this is rumor and speculation and malicious or whether there is something we need to worry about here. And you were given reassurances by both parties that there was well, I, if, if it's all right with you, uh, Chair, I'd like uh, Kyla. Now, Kyla is uh, not just company secretary, she also is director, she runs compliance and also whistleblowing in, in ITV. I mean, she's responsible for those policies. I'd like to just go through the sequence so you can see what we did to try and establish whether anything was going on. Okay. Kyla. Certainly. So, um, we first really became aware that uh, of some of speculation and, and social media speculation, which was triggered by a newspaper article on the 6th of December 2019. Um, and in that article, there was a reference. It was it was an article with many um, allegations and a lot of commentary about this morning and about the relationship between Phil and Holly. Um, uh, and other presenters on that, but also there was a reference to um, a, a, a Philips PA and personal runner um, moving to a different program despite a, pre a previous close friendship with him. Those were the words. Um, and there was a huge amount of media speculation. Uh, our head of daytime and our head of production on that day spoke to Person X because he was being inundated by uh, um, press, by journalists contacting him, was aware of social media, and they asked the question at that stage, is there any truth in this? Is there anything that we need to know about a relationship with Philip Schofield? And the answer was a categorical no. He was traumatized by the intrusion in his personal life, and our focus at that point then moved swiftly to duty of care for him and trying to make sure that we could support him in whatever way, whatever ways were appropriate uh, to handle uh, the social media uh, intrusion on his life. Um, we, conversations with him continued in January. Um, again, the focus on duty of care, but also asking the question each time. So we had HR involvement by this stage, uh, the um, head of production who has continued having dialogue with Person X over the last three years at intervals, uh, Person X and our head of HR for daytime uh, spoke to him on many occasions um, 
focusing on his welfare, but also using the opportunity to ask the questions. I think he was asked the question 12 times, and we have logs of the uh, conversations that were had with him. At each stage, he categorically denied it. Um, when Philip came out um, on the 7th of February, I believe it was, in 2020, again, a spike in social media commentary, and uh, again, there were meetings with Person X and questions with him. In parallel at that stage, serious conversations with Philip Schofield and his agent, um, very direct conversations with his agent, and that was Kevin who can talk to those, also our head of daytime and our editor in daytime. So at each stage, we had various levels of management asking questions of both individuals, also of Philip's um, uh, um, agent, um, and in addition, as, as Carolyn has mentioned, there were various conversations with people on the production floor. Um, our head of production asked people working on both This Morning and Loose Woman, um, who might have been closer to Person X, to try and establish were there any facts, were they aware of any truth in this matter, and the answer at each stage was no. So we conducted all of those conversations at that time. No one came forward with any evidence. Um, straightforward categorical denials each time it was asked and conversations continued also in um, May this year right up to the day when Philip finally admitted that he'd been lying to us uh, and at each stage denials. So Kevin I don't know if you want to touch Yes on I, I, when did I first know? I think when, when Philip decided he wanted to come out um, the agents and Philip's going to be contacted the <coughs> Head of daytime and the producer of the programme, and he said, I, I want, I've been thinking about this for a long time, I want to come out uh, on air. And so that was discussed. And then I think when they'd had that discussion, I was called about it saying, There's going to be a big thing tomorrow, what do you think? I said, Well, if that's what he wants to do, okay. Um, it, Philip presents the programme Monday to Thursdays, he doesn't do it Friday. He, so this was on the Thursday, and he came out the next day when he didn't have to then sort of present the entire programme. So he just did it on uh, a, a show that he wasn't presenting that day. Um, so I went down the next morning to to the studio to see Philip, to see how he was and everything. And uh, there were various people around and, and we discussed, you know, was he sure? He's really agitated and nervous. And and I, I remember saying to him, look, you don't, you don't have to do this now if you don't want to. You don't have to do it on TV if you don't want to. He said, no, 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 this is absolutely the way I want to do it. I've been thinking about this. This isn't a sudden decision. I've been talking about this with my family. I've, I've, this, I've, it's just the moment now I want to do it. So I said, OK. Then there was a moment when we were alone. And I said, look, Philip, don't worry about ITV supporting you through this. It's, it's fine by us if you want to do this. What, though, is there anything that you want to tell me now? Is there anything we should know that has prompted this or that you want to share with us now? Because it's, it's fine, but we just don't want suddenly tomorrow or the next day to hear something we didn't know about and be blindsided by. And he absolutely, you know, categorically said, no, there's nothing. This is just a private matter and I want to get it out there because I've been thinking about it for so long. So, so that was it, really. So from what you're saying, I mean, it sounds like it sounds to me like you regard the efforts that you went to 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 chase this up as being uh, adequate and I mean I'm not going to put words in your mouth do you think well, that sure. they were adequate we, do you think we, that they were competent what we think about this is that just remember there's another very important t bit of the timeline which is on March the uh, 2018 uh, all, all ITV employees were sent home uh, because lockdown started um, and so this was very close on to um, uh, March 2020, did I say 2018? March 2020. So it's just quite important that, because then this all stopped, because there was, th th no one was at work, and uh, actually Person X was put on furlough for nine months. So it's just an import important thing, and over that time, um, our head of production had duty of care conversations with him. But, but nothing else. So it's just important in terms of the process we went through that it, that it stopped in March for, for reasons of lockdown. Um, what we would say is that we had done, we feel, from a uh, process perspective, but also from a human perspective, 
Um, we asked multiple times of both individuals, both formally and informally. And so we felt that was proportionate to what we had because we had no evidence. No one brought us anything tangible, either on the production floor or from the outside. There was only hearsay and rumor and speculation. The other thing we would say is that we were very, very concerned about the state of mind of both Philip and Person X. So Philip was not in a good state, as Kevin will tell you, when he came out very anxious, very worried, very nervous, very worried about the social media backlash, all of those things. And person X um, could not really grasp the media intrusion that was so prevalent in his life now. And so we had to balance how we asked questions. And we did ask them formally. There were meetings. HR was present. So we did a balance of informal kind of is there anything we need to know? How can we help you to person X? How can we help you? What more do we need to know? You can do this confidentially. You can do this anonymously. You can talk to a counselor. You know, just because we wanted to make it easier for him, because you're, you're, you're not used to being in the press as often or in social media uh, when you're uh, in, that, in that position. Um, so we were, you know, very mindful of our kind of duty of care obligations, but just as a human being, not, not making what was a very difficult situation for person X and actually also Philip worse. So it sounds to me as if you're saying that the investigation was thorough and the decisions that you made were well-founded. <clears throat> Chair, can I please just say it was not an investigation. I wouldn't qualify this as an investigation. I think this was a review. It was an ongoing review that, um, that every time there were periods of, of, of um, intense speculation, we went in and asked more questions, but it was an ongoing review. Would the assertion then, lead, leading from that, be that if you could go back in time and do it all again, you'd do it exactly the same way and you would probably have reached the same conclusion? I think that if we had our time again, let's see, I, I'm not hiding behind the KC, but let's see what the KC <coughs> says, uh, because that's one of the things we want to learn, which is, is there anything that we could have done or spotted? At the moment, we can't see what that is, because we did interview both individuals, as I've said, but also other people, we have a very, very clear and loud speaking up policy. We really do. I mean, the vast majority of people, when they uh, reply to surveys that we do on this, say that they uh, feel confident that we will act if they speak up. That comes from a tangible, quantitative survey. So we have done, and we can talk about our speak up policy later, our whistleblowing pol policy. So. Anybody at any time could have confidentially gone to our helpline, safe call. It's, it's completely anonymous. It's run by an external uh, company. They could have at any time said something about this. We had none of that. So, so therefore, we feel in the circumstances and with what we had, that we had no legal reasons to go any further with an investigation. If we'd had any evidence, we would have done a formal investigation. We had no ev evidence. There was absolutely, it's not in our interest in any way not to investigate something that we know has evidence to support it. You know, put it another way, had we gone into, with, with no legal reason, into a formal investigation, we would have caused a huge amount of uh, damage, I think. The mental health issues around, you know, the strain, in certain mental health issues, let me just say the psychological strain mm -hmm. on person X, et cetera, would have, been, would have been quite intense. And so we didn't have any legal grounds to do that. As far as you're concerned, there's no circumstances under which you could possibly have inadvertently or purposefully turned a blind eye to some serious shortcomings at this morning because it was an incredibly commercially successful program. It's nothing to do with it being commercially successful. It really, really isn't. I mean, all our shows are actually commercially successful. You could say that about every single one of our shows. There's not a show in ITV because we're a commercial P PSB that is unsuccessful. So you say that about, it is nothing to do with commercial uh, success. It is entirely to do with how we were trying to look after people, but we were also trying to ask, and we did ask questions repeatedly, continuously, 
and were repeatedly told there was nothing happening. And I also said that as we see it today, our understanding and our information so far is that we could not have done this differently. But if the KC does say and recommend that in future we should do any aspects differently, we will listen, we will learn, and we will act. But today, and there were no, nobody, nobody would be turning a blind eye to something. It's not a blind eye. I mean, nobody here uh, or on the management board would ever turn a blind eye to something as serious as this. The only thing I would say in response to that is surely you're aware that the same imbalance of power that enabled Mr Schofield to enter into this, what he called inappropriate relationship would also be in play if he was seeking to keep that relationship secret. So you need to ensure that you've got in place the systems and processes that are somehow able to find a way around that. So let, so let us tell you what our systems and processes are to ensure that that doesn't happen. And perhaps you could talk about our sure. speaking up and safeguarding uh, policies. We'll, we'll come to that later on, actually. We've got, we've got a few other questions we want to get to first, but thank you, uh, Clive. Yeah, j just uh, very briefly, I, I listened to, to those answers. We as a committee are very concerned about the welfare of the individuals that are involved here, uh, in particular Philip Schofield, but, but, but most of all, a person X. So could you tell us what uh, support you're giving to them at this moment in time <coughs> and whether that will continue into the future? Yes, we've remained in touch with Philip, as you'd expect, uh, and uh, he is receiving counselling. Um, we're just saying that Philip is just receiving counselling, and uh, which ICV um, are funding, um, and uh, that he, he asked for that, and, and we're very happy to do that. Um, we, uh, with Person X, there's a whole series of duty of care all the way through. I mean, e e even though um, he uh, left the company in 2021. Um, um, we, we have constantly given him <coughs> aspects of duty of care as recently as last week. So do you want to outline some of that duty of care? Certainly. So, so the, as I said earlier, the, the director uh, or the head of production <coughs> who was involved in having the initial conversations with him has been uh, continuing those conversations and, uh, with him throughout. Uh, is in contact with him, not on a daily basis at the moment, but on a regular basis at the moment. Um, we have offered him an ongoing package of, of support, including counselling. Um, we have given some support when there was media um, intrusion, uh, physical media intrusion in, in, at his parents' home uh, and also in his workplace. We offered support around that and we've been offering support and trying to help him manage uh, takedowns and social media. So there is a, a package of support and that is ongoing. We're in discussion with him um, last time a couple of days ago. And it, it, we're, we're, we've seen reported, as you've written to us, saying that he doesn't want to speak, he doesn't want to, any publicity <coughs> around this, and he wants it really to die and go away, which I fully understand. But if he wanted to speak out, you're not aware of any impediment to prevent him from doing so? There's no, there's no impediment. There are no... Um, NDAs, gagging orders, there is nothing in place for, from, from our perspective that would stop him speaking out. Uh, when he left ITV, he entered into a standard settlement agreement. There is a clear carve-out in that, which makes it very clear that for whistleblowing speaking up, there is nothing that would prevent him from doing so. Thank you. Do you share concerns that Philip Schofield's being hounded like Caroline Flack? Um, I, 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 can't, I don't want to... Comp I, I don't want to make those comparisons, although I would say I think he has been hounded, and I think he said himself that he has nothing really. If it wasn't for his daughters, he wouldn't be alive. He said that publicly. And are you, you personally, individually concerned for his welfare? I'm very concerned, yes. I, 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 look, I spoke to him the day before just because I knew that him standing down from this morning was, was a pretty major thing in his life. Um, I actually phoned him and just said, look, you know, I know this is very difficult, uh, and uh, you know, Kevin has offered you um, further work, uh, so you know, please don't feel awful about it. That there is more, you know. And he was really grateful that I'd called him. He said, "Look, this means so much to me." Um, I didn't know he was going to say on Friday that he had lied to us and that he had hidden this for so long. Um, but no, we have been concerned uh, about Philip. And we've been extremely concerned about Person X because 
the level of intrusion in his life is, is, is unbelievably awful. Have you individually spoken to either of them since that? I, I've never spoken to Person X. If you do, just for the, I, I just it wouldn't it wouldn't be something that I would do. But I have spoken to Philip, as I've just said. But have you spoken to Philip since the uh, since he uh, admitted that he lied about this relationship? He just sent me a text saying how um, how deeply deeply sorry he is uh, for lying to ITV and to his family and for how much you know ha has been caused by it. I, I did I speak to him, um, mm. uh, rather like Caroline, I spoke to him when he wanted to step down from this morning. I think it was the daily, you know, effort of doing a show for two hours live every day was the thing that made him think, I, 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 there's too much noise and I can't, I don't want to do it anymore, so sorry. Um, is that all right? And we said, well, if you want to step down, you, you can step down. Um, and we did talk about, uh, because there was another show coming up a couple of weeks later, the SOAP Awards that he was booked to present. And I said, are you still OK to do the SOAP Awards? Do you want to do that? He said, yes, absolutely. Um, Dancing on Ice is the only other show he does for us, which is in January, once a week show. Um, uh, and he asked about that. And we said, well, don't worry about that now. That's so far away. We can deal with that later. But don't worry. And I think on the record, I said he would be continuing to work with us. And then and I can't remember if I actually asked him at that conversation but th there isn't anything, is there, Philip? Um, and he said, uh, but he would have said, no, there wasn't. I mean, it was just three or four days before he said, actually, sorry, I've been lying all the time. He looked me in the eye and promised me uh, that there was absolutely no truth whatsoever in this, in the rumours of this um, relationship. And because it was corroborated, I suppose, by Person X, and there had been, through the whole of this, there been no complaints as such from certainly anybody in ITV about it. Obviously, there were rumours and things. Um, I, you know, I believed him, and I believed his agents and everyone. And then two days later, everybody comes out and says, I mean, no, it's a lie. It is important to talk about how many times you spoke to the agent or that the head of daytime spoke to the agent. So a lot of, a lot of conversations were had with... Philip's agent about yes. this whole issue. Yeah, many more than with Philip himself. So you can be a lot more direct, obviously, with the agent. And the agent, because the agency um, handles quite a lot of clients on ITV, um, we talked to them a lot, and they were consistently adamant uh, that these rumours and more kind of, what should we do to make them go away? Can we take legal action? What can we do? And, and discussions like that, but absolute categorical denial. And of course, it's not true. No, you know, no, Philip's definitely not. No, no, no. Um, and so we didn't pursue that with them. <clears throat> and, th and then later, of course, they said he, li he had been lying to them for 20 years, whatever it was. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, everybody. And Dame Caroline, do you ever find yourself asking yourself the existential question, why am I here? I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm not as deeply philosoph philosophical as that, Mr. I mean, Brennan. Because I, I'm not sure where that question is going. So all I would say is, is that I am here because I believe in public service broadcasting, and I believe in ITV, and I think what we do is an incredible public service. But it's also entertaining, and we do m mm. massive amount of news. We do regional news better than anybody else. And we're very proud of what we do, and that's why I'm here. I mean, I and I, you left off that list and the glory of our parliamentary democracy as well. You believe, in and as well, we presumably. support through our news <coughs> in particular uh, our democracy. Because I can't remember, in the 22 years that I've been a member of Parliament, ignoring more phone calls and messages from journalists on any subject than this. Why do you think that is? I, look, I think that we are we produce a huge range of programmes. We have a huge amount of talent. I, I, I think the BBC get the same as we do. So whenever anything is going on at the BBC, it tends to dominate the news agenda. Uh, I think whenever anything is happening at ITV, I mean, we're on the news pages for many reasons other than this, i.e. for our entertainment shows. I mean, we will do a big entertainment show like I'm a Celebrity. We'll be on front pages every day uh, of, of the papers. So I think... That yeah, is, that, that is, that point, Ms. Brennan, though, I think that is because the BBC and ITV are part of British absolutely. culture, society, and, and, and on life. that point, what I was going to say is that this is all very interesting. Is it, that the whole thing is fascinating which you know, the, and which it which interests is, the public. But I'm struggling, or am I wrong in struggling, to try and identify how this is all in the public interest that we need 
to know all of this. And, and, and there, there are serious issues, obviously, underlying all this. And so I don't want to trivialise it. But in, why is all of this in the public interest, do you think? I, look, uh, as Rather a PS, I, I feel that I'm here. I mean, if, I was, uh, a, 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 if we weren't a PSB, I don't think I'd be sitting in front of you. Uh, I think if I was, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure I would be. I don't know. I mean, you can answer that. But I think as a PSB, uh, you know, our, uh, you, you will want to hear what we've done and how we've done it. Yes, and, and, we I, and I you understand and that. And, as I, yeah. and I, as I said, I've, I've welcomed that because I wanted very much to put some facts clearly down. And I also wanted you to understand how seriously we take things, but also how much we care about the people that work at ITV. This is, this is a vibrant, you know, creative, proud organization. And what has been said, uh, you know, from the outside often, or from people who uh, are no longer at ITV, you know, I, people feel very deeply about that at ITV. No, okay. no, no one feels um, at ITV, you know, the vast majority of people at ITV feel that they are, <coughs> you know, they're looked after, that you know, we have many, many different ways that they can tell us their feedback and their input. It doesn't always have to be a complaint. It can just be about, I'm not getting flexibility at work and I need some help. It could be a whole range of different things. But we do listen and we have okay. so many different ways of listening. So I can't really answer why you've got me here. I can say why no. I am here. And I accept that's not your, your role because we invited you after all. But what were the policies and procedures in place in ITV for incidents of this type? <clears throat> at the time of the initial investigations into these rumours surrounding yeah. Philip Th That's where I was getting. So I'm, thank, thank you. Um, Carla, would you just go through our yes. you know, what we do? So, so our policies and, and procedures, although obviously they are, you know, they're updated regularly, whether it's to, to take account of new regulation, <coughs> Ofcom guidance, but also best practice. So uh, clearly our policies and practices as they stand today will be slightly different to those that were in place in 2019. So how, but not have, they, a lot, how have they changed? But not a lot. Um, for example, there was a new Ofcom code on, on um, protecting participants in shows, which came out uh, post-2019. So we will have incorporated that into our policies and practices. It's that type of thing. I mean, the fund fundamentally, the policies that we had in place in 2019, and, and it would be helpful for me to give you the shape of those and the, those that are important here um, are, are very, very similar to what we have in place now. So we have had at, at ITV a code of conduct. Our code of conduct, code of ethics and conduct, is the policy that uh, underpins everything. Lots of policies flow from that. Um, it's a, a, um, a policy that is incorporated into the contracts of everyone who works for or with ITV employees, freelancers and others. And it sets out very clearly what our expectations are of conduct at ITV. Both the conduct that we expect and the conduct that we, we um, do not tolerate. Mm. It is, it is a, a, a very accessible policy document. It, is, it has a, a message from the CEO uh, at the front. Um, which explains why it's so important and why it's so important also to speak up if you okay. see that there are any, there's anything that, going on. That, that, that all sounds great and, 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 and we can take a look at that, I'm sure. But what I'm interested in is that you said there have been some minor changes. Are any of the changes that have happened um, as a result of this matter? No. So I can, if I could just, just yeah. sorry, can I just so, so no changes as a result of this matter. Um, and the important points in our, um, some of the important points in our, <coughs> our code of conduct, as well as absolutely setting out very, very clearly what our, our speaking up policy is, which I'd like to come on to, um, is that we do not accept any bullying or harassment, and there is zero tolerance for abusive position. So anything that, and that was in place in 2016, 2019. 2021, 2023. Okay. And th okay. there is a workplace relationship form that you now have to, f have to fill in. That started at the start of 2022. Was, it's not a new policy in response to this at all. It was something that we updated because we update our policies every year, as Kyla said, um, that we updated that and we actually said that everybody who works at ITV has to fill in a form uh, where they have to disclose workplace relationships, whether they are romantic or family relationships. I see. Um, okay. And 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 we've we've had that in place since then. Okay. Thank you, Chair.
What do you say in response to the allegation that there was a toxic culture at this morning? Um, what I would say is, is that um, it's not something Look, we take that seriously. You know, as you've heard me talk about culture, it's incredibly important to me personally, uh, and so it deeply disappoints me, right? But we we do not recognise that in this morning, and I think the reason for that is that, you know, we have tangible evidence to to tell you where the vast majority of people at daytime at this morning are extremely engaged and very motivated. It's not to say that we don't take complaints about it seriously. We've had two complaints in five years about that issue, right? T two complaints, both of them taken very seriously. One of them investigated internally, one of them ex publicly disclosed, um, so I can name the person, I think. But uh, Ranj Singh complained. Um, I actually asked for an external investigation that happened and was not able to be upheld. So I, I do want to give you, I, if you don't mind, I do want to give you some facts. The participation in our engagement survey, which is done by an external company called Culture Amp, would say nearly 80% of people in ITV participated in that survey. That's high, right? A lot of companies have 60% participation. So that means people want to participate. Um, it tells us how people are actually experiencing working at ITV, and it's totally confidential. They can say whatever they want. They will never be traced or tracked, so you can't do it. So it's done in externally completely. In daytime specifically, 89% of people say they are proud to work at ITV. 86% would recommend ITV daytime as a place to work, as a great place to work. 80% of people at daytime are happy with how their manager motivates them. And 75% of them say that colleagues from all backgrounds have equal opportunities to succeed at ITV. So I'm giving you those tangible kind of points. Now, we didn't, everything was not glowing in an engagement survey, but the strong, these are strong scores about how people feel about working there on daytime. So I, I actually brought the figures in for daytime rather than for the whole of ITV, although, of course, you can see, if you would like to, the ITV wide stats, which are very similar to the daytime stats, although the day daytime statistics are actually higher than ITV overall. So I think when you use the word, when you use those words about our culture, you know, we are, we don't recognize that culture. Doesn't mean we don't take those allegations seriously. It doesn't mean we don't take complaints seriously. We do. Just to build on what Kyla said, if you don't mind, in terms of policies, because it's all very well having policies. But if people don't read the policy or they find, you know, that they, they just ignore them or they say, oh, that's just, you know, corporate gobbledygook, th there are so many other ways that people can make themselves heard. We have an ambassador network at ITV, which is 80 strong. These are people who are elected by people in our offices, of which we have about 24 around the country. They are elected representatives of people. They have regular meetings, not just with members of the management board and listening circles. They actually have a non-exec director who they can go to at any time with any problem or any complaint, and they can do that anonymously with the non-exec director on our PLC board, who is an independent director. We have unbelievably strong networks. We have five very strong networks that represent various communities in ITV. There are 3,000 people out of 5,000 belong to those networks in ITV. And there are, the, are 4,000 people in the UK that work uh, at ITV and there are 1,000 freelancers. So 3,000 out of 4,000 people belong to those networks. Those chairs are elected by the people. Uh, they are very strong, the chairs, and they are brilliant networks. I personally talk to them. I chair a, 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 a committee where all of those chairs sit around the table and say the things that they're most worried about, the things that are going really, really well, and we have a discussion, and we do it across all the networks. So those are just examples of how you have a com formal complaints procedure, which is all about HR and kind of documenting and having the meetings with HR and your line manager and whatever. But if that is not you know, if you don't want to do that because you think that's worrying to you or you, you, you're concerned about that, if you don't get on with your line manager, <coughs> there are multiple other routes, and I've already mentioned Safe Call, which is a number that we promote for whistleblowing um, widely. It's in, I'm afraid, it is in the toilets, it is on lifts, it is in car parks, it, it's everywhere. It's on my ITV, 
it's you know we I, I talk about it in my vodcast I do a vodcast every two three to three weeks for the whole of ITV and I say don't forget anything you want to say just give us either I've, I've got an email I've got an email box called ask Carolyn they can just email that box and they will always get a reply or they can go to safe calls so what I'm trying to describe is it's all very well having policies but actually policies are sometimes not read by people so you can do as much as you can on policy but actually what we really really foster is a culture where if anyone has a problem if anyone is concerned about somebody else they can tell us in multiple ways yes thank you uh, chair um I'm finding this all very sad and, and like Kevin Brennan, I really don't understand why there's such a, a media frenzy when we have war in Ukraine, starvation in Africa and Indian rail accidents, etc. Having said that, uh, I do understand the power of personality. Um, but w one question, you, you've very forcefully put uh, your case uh, for, for the way you manage things formally, how there are ways of people <coughs> being able to talk to the management of ITV. But we all know, or many of us know, that um, once you have a long-running program, or a theatrical production, or a any program, that they tend to develop their own culture within another culture. You, you've got ITV, then you've got celebrity doing this over here, then, then you've got this morning doing that over there. And gradually, these, these uh, cultures can become toxic, can become poisonous, because they are close and free, febrile by their very nature. Now, uh, th there is another aspect to this. Um, when, uh, for instance, and I, I use the example of the BBC here, when they started dismantling the BBC club system that they used to have, which was a very useful cross-fertilization tool where people talk to each other on a social level about issues. Once you take that away and people aren't meeting across the different programs that are being made, have we taken away some form of reference for people to actually air these views totally informally without going through the management system. I'll start and then I'll hand over to Kevin because of, of, of productions, but I think we've done the reverse. I think what we did over lockdown, which you know many people in the world found very, very difficult, but people who were used to coming in every day um, and being in a buzzy culture and you know with lots of teammates, they found it particularly difficult. We actually did a huge number of um, things virtually when we couldn't do them physically. And we, um, uh, you know, we would do social gatherings. So the networks were brilliant. They did a lot of cross, cross collaboration. So if you were in the Embrace Network, which is um, or, or people of color, if you were in the Disability Network, if you were in the Women's Network, the three of them would get together and do a big event. They'd get someone to come in and talk about mental health, or they'd come in and talk about adapting to different kinds of life. Um, and everyone could ask questions, you could ask anonymous questions, you could follow up after. So we did a whole series of things virtually. So there was something in most days through lockdown, believe it or not, so that people could connect. It was very important for us to make sure that people felt connected to ITV through lockdown. Um, and the feedback on that has been very, very positive. Um, I did a vodcast every single week. People could ask me directly questions every single week, all the way through lockdown. Post lockdown, I think we've actually done even more face to face because we're all now in one building in White City. So the whole of our London offices are now for the first time, I think ever, in one building in White City. And so we do things on a Friday, we do previews, we do, we do, and, we, and the networks do quite serious events. So let's talk about bullying. Let's talk about this. What does bullying look like? What does, uh, you know, if you've got a problem, what would you, who would you talk to? How would you talk? We've got a balanced network. But importantly, it's less formal. There is very informal ways that the networks in particular uh, organise events with our funding and with our support. Okay, thank you. Kevin, you again. Yeah, I think with, um, in production, again, being in one building really helps this, but you, there is a lot of movement actually between people working on one show and then going on and working on another. Um, because the periods that you might be engaged on making a show are not necessarily, not unlike this morning or something, which is all year round. So some periods, some programs just come in for a few weeks to make it and then move on. But the people that come in to make those shows um, have often worked on other shows. So there's, you know, a lot of people know a lot of people at ITV. And I think, I think there is a culture, certainly that I've seen, of 
um, friendship across different departments. You know, the entertainment department is obviously a, a huge group of people, and they they all work together and move across from one show to another. So I think there is a lot of cross fertilization about things. They'll be talking socially. You know, we're we're not the, the management is not necessarily present for these conversations, which is a good thing, because I know exactly what you mean about the BBC Club system. Um, so it's it's more ad hoc and informal, but I think there is a lot of discussion amongst uh, all members of staff with each other about what's going on and how you're finding it over there and all that. So, so you, you, you felt informed, you felt like you had your finger on the pulse, not only formally but socially as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, did it come as a great surprise to you? Because it, it came as a huge surprise to me, the, the, the vituperative outburst that came as a result of these, this, these disclosures. Uh, for instance, I'm uh, Eamon Holmes said in a tweet uh, that Schofield has finally been caught out, but he's not the only guilty party. Four high members of IT management knew the sort of man he was and never once took action to prevent him controlling or taking advantage of young people. That's an extraordinary tweet to come out with and, and I would imagine extremely damaging. Um, um, you must have been surprised to receive that. Um, we didn't receive it. It was on Twitter. Well, to see it. Don't look at Twitter. To see it. Um, I, I think it's probably, it's actually defamatory, never mind anything else. But of course, we wouldn't say that uh, because it would just inflame the situation. But mm. Kevin, I mean, perhaps you, you know Amy. Yeah, I, I, I don't know Amy. I mean, there, there's, it's worth an observation here that, that there's been a very vocal um, uh, criticism of the, and, and the mention of all this toxic culture and everything like this. And it, it's quite a few people. Uh, who've got a platform now with a show elsewhere or a newspaper column or whatever it is, or just on Twitter, to, to have a big go. And, and it, it just occurred to me the other day, actually, that a lot of these people, there aren't a lot of them, but the few that there are, you know, they worked as presenters on ITV for a very long time, some of them, yeah. over 10 years. There was never any complaint from them whilst they were there. If they wanted anything, it was more work, please. We love it here. Can we do more? And then where I have some, some sympathy for them is when, you know, presenters of programmes often have a sort of a slight feeling of divine right to stay there forever. Um, and obviously ITV as a company and producers of programmes um, maybe have a different agenda and want to change and fresh, want to bring on new people and so forth. Um, and so it's only really, and this is why I do have sympathy for them, when you have to have the difficult conversation of, thank you very much, it's been really good, but actually we, we'd like you to do less. Mm. Um, it's, it's not very nice. And, and I get that because this is their life. They love it. They've never complained. They thoroughly enjoy it. And their response always is, is one of disappointment and, oh, can't I stay, can't I do anything? Which is why, honestly, I tend almost never to just cut but say, look, you've been, thank you very much for all the work you've been doing. You're doing a great job, but we want to try other things. But don't we're not jettisoning you. We'd just like you to do a bit less or maybe try and find something else for you as well. Because they have been, generally speaking, loyal servants to ITV. And so they, they deserve to be treated properly like that. So, uh, but, but it's not surprising, is it, that when they go, they're suddenly like, oh, I hate ITV. Oh, it's awful. When for you know, a decade or more, they were there, uh, reaping the rewards and enjoying the job and everybody seemed to get on. You're, you're saying that this isn't in indicative of a pressure cooker building up, this is more to do with... No, I don't, I don't see that, no. OK, thank you. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Chair. you very much. Um, can we keep the answers as pithy as possible? We've got quite a lot to cover right. today. Thank you. Uh, Jane. Thank you, Dame Caroline, and uh, good morning, Dame Caroline. Um, in your letter to the committee, uh, you uh, talk about no evidence of a relationship beyond hearsay and rumour. Um, what, where's that line between actual evidence and hearsay and rumour? What would you have accepted as something more solid? Uh, I think if someone had seen something uh, inappropriate, if someone was uh, had uh, heard something that they wanted investigated because they'd actually heard something said by one of those individuals that was inappropriate that would you know any anything i think uh, anything that would have been tangible rather than rumor the first party sort of witnessing. well i think it, it you know you don't you know the, the the effect of a an investigation internally for individuals is extremely uh serious obviously but it's also extremely 
straining. It's a big strain mm. uh, on, on, the, on the people. Now, that's not a reason not to do it, but, if you, but I do think legally, you know, employment law would say you have to have evidence, you have to have something tangible that says you are going to do this. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your earlier evidence that a person X was asked 12 times if he was in a relationship. I, I started to get echoes of an old war film with a, a floodlight in over my a face. Over a period, a long period of um, time. This was not in one go. If someone this asked me whether time. it was over a period of time, or if I were asked the same thing 12 times, I'd start to feel slightly victimised if I obviously didn't want to say anything about that. Just, just remember, it depends on the context and the tone of that question. So I think that if that was being, uh, you know, if it was like this, and you were asking for evidence, uh, and it was in a very formal setting, that, that may well be true, but that wasn't like that. There were a you know, couple of formal meetings uh, w w which were had with HR. There were multiple kind of informal meetings. And remember also the motive with the question was to help person X, so that if anything was worrying him or troubling him, or there was, if there was anything he wanted to say that was inappropriate, because the rumors were rife about the inappropriateness of this. Um, and therefore, that is why he was asked at various different points of time in many different ways and by different people. And there was one particular person, the head of production, who has a very good relationship with and he trusts. And she's the one, I think, who was very much saying, if we can help, please say anything that, you know, we care about you. Uh, that's where she would have been coming from on, on some of the questions. I, I can't decide where this line is because as, uh, two consenting adults in who both work for your company, um, where is that line between just a gross invasion of privacy? You mentioned your workplace relationship policy. If I, as an adult woman, entered a relationship with uh, a man you know, who wasn't vastly different in terms of rank or status to me, is, is it any of your business? Is, is that no, what? look, I, I think... You know, it's it's important this thing about um, imbalance, um, and I, and I feel that's what we've taken seriously. It's not about trying to invade people's private lives and 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 who they see and what they do. It's it's about the workplace. So some relationships that work, I think we all know, are inevitable. I think the most important thing we can do is to maintain a professional attitude and boundaries to make sure all of our people know that they have to have a professional attitude and they have to have boundaries to avoid inappropriate behavior. And that's why we have the code of conduct, the safeguarding policy, the speaking up policy, the workplace relationship policy. You know, the whole thing we are trying to do every day actually is to ensure that we have a safe and respectful place where people come to work. So if you cross that boundary, and I think you would say that <coughs> someone with that kind of different dynamic in power, that was inappropriate. And I think we would have, if we had had any evidence or knowledge of that, if Philip had said that to us, we would have acted swiftly in that we would have investigated and we would have taken action. However that action would be, I can't say because it's hypothetical because it would depend on, on when and where, and, but it was inappropriate uh, at, to have a relationship with someone so junior uh, in daytime. Thank you. Um, many uh, armchair commentators on social media would point out the irony of Parliament uh, speaking to a company about uh, appropriate relationships at work, but uh, I, I'd like to ask what action would have been appropriate? I know you've said it is hypothetical, but the circumstances are fairly clear. Um, and the individuals are, are known to you. So what would have been appropriate reaction had one of the individuals admitted it and said, we're in a relationship and it's all fine? There's, what I think, that, think that's where the context is very, very important. I think the context becomes all important. So uh, rather than going through all the scenarios, I think we have to say it would depend on... We would say this is a deeply inappropriate workplace relationship given the power imbalance. Uh, deeply inappropriate in any context. Would you have covered that up? No. If, you'd have, if, the, no. if one of the individuals had admitted why, a relationship, why? Why, why, is why it, would no? I don't think so. I think you know it is their private lives, but it is in the workplace, and therefore, if it, 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 once it is in the workplace, I think it does become something that we wouldn't, in any way, try to cover up in any way. And would you have taken one of your biggest 
stars and, and someone who nationally was uh, everyone was so fond of, would you have removed him from? Yes, yes I think if, if that was necessary, if the context allowed, you know gave us that, if the investigation said, I mean, you know that things have emerged that are deeply inappropriate in the workplace, uh, and I think if we'd known that at the time, we'd have acted very swiftly. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, Julie. Thank you, Chair, <coughs> and good morning. Just good morning. Um, one of the things I want to ask about is Philip Schofield has said that he he um, got Person X's jobs on other ITV shows that he worked on. Um, were you or other members of IT man management aware that he'd got this person jobs on other jo on other programmes that he worked on? Um, and is that usual that stars have that preferential treatment of people? Right, so I think I'll, I'll answer that and Kevin can come in here. I think the first thing to know is that when it, it's been reported that he's a PA and a personal runner, that doesn't exist at ITV. No runner is a personal runner for anyone. There is a pool of runners, there are three on daytime uh, on this morning and they all share the work. So. Person X was working for Eamon Holmes and Ruth Langsford, as well as Holly, uh, as well as Philip. So th th that's the first fact that I think is very important. And we don't have PAs. We have PAs, but they're not runners. Uh, so, so that's important. Um, I think, Kevin, would you um, answer the question about how it works in terms of what people ask for and what they don't yeah, ask for? Yeah, it, it is common for um, presenters, performers to want a sort of familiar crew around them. Certainly, always, I would say, with sort of glam teams, as they're called, with the dresses and the makeup artists and things like that. Um, less less so, perhaps, with runners, though I don't think it's uh, this is the only occasion. I would say, certainly for researchers, for writers that they trust and know, and things like that, so they do move around. Uh, I think, as I mentioned before, remember, this morning is, is slightly unusual in that it never ends, so it's just on forever. Um, other programmes, you know, can have a very short production period, and it, it's not that unusual for producers to bring people over, for uh, presenters to say, "Well, can we have that nice researcher that worked for us? He was seen very bright, whatever it is." So it's n it's not that unusual, no. And I think on what you're referring to, I think actually the agent requested uh, person X. Right. It didn't come direct. The agent requested it didn't come direct from Philip. Yes, it would it would always it would nearly always be the agent that would contact not not us but the producer or, or whoever was responsible on the show for hiring this level of person to say oh um, Philip would like this person to work on is that all right can we do that and then it would be handled by the production team and didn't we find out that person X was asked for by other talent yes I think he was asked I think actually Eamon and Ruth asked for him to because everyone thought very well of him uh, could he come and work? I think she was doing work for QVC or something, and could he come and kind of help out on that? And I think he did, and things like that. So there, there is a lot of movement. Where is that? I can understand it for things like makeup artists mm. and things that are very personal, and um, you know, you, you can have that rapport and think somebody does your makeup very well or whatever. The runner, it's a different, different type of job. Do you think if this happens, which clearly you're saying it does, it, it's appropriate to do that? Is it appropriate for stars to have that level of? input in those kind of decisions you know the thing is what I would say what I've seen because I've gone to a lot of live shows yeah. and what I see is is that what a runner will do is just get everything organized taxis take them to the taxi get the taxi in the right place uh, make sure there's some food in the dressing room water in the dressing room whatever you want there whatever you want here that's what a runner does I mean a runner just does you know makes life easy for whoever they're working for on the show and or often they're working for an entire show um, and so I, I, I've, I've, I've personally seen how runners mm. help uh, <coughs> on Dancing on Ice, for instance, or on The Voice, for instance. You know, you, you, runners come to every show uh, when they're being produced live. I mean, that's certainly my yes. take on it, but I don't, you know, what do you think? And they tend to work, remember, runners are usually just used for a couple of days when the show is actually being recorded, so for production last week's, but they may be not around during the week, but they're, they're on set to help get everything done on the day. But Julie, you could be right. I mean, you know, as I say, we are not complacent about this. If, if, if with the case you were, in fact, in fact, ourselves, when we start looking through again, if there is something where we could tighten up how runners re maybe register what they do or something, there may, may be something there. 
Um, because you're right, they're runners and they're very happy. They want they, they want to do well, mm. and and most runners are actually very ambitious. They and don't they want to stay things, as runners. They want to become. And they become, make things tick. If we're yeah, and they really make things tick. Yeah. So um, uh, so there may be something there. But, um, Philip Schofield announced his departure from this morning, as he said on the 20th of May. And he said, "I understand ITV has decided the current situation can't go on." Who made that decision? I did, I suppose, ultimately, in that but these things are collective and they're a discussion between producers and the head of daytime and various other people involved. Uh, constant dialogue with the agent when it's as, as big a thing as this. But if, I, if I can just expand the question a bit, what do you think the situation was that couldn't go on? I think exactly? it was the media speculation. Yeah. It was um, uh, amongst the staff, amongst... Um, some of them it was, th this, is, this is sort of relentless, will it ever go away, how can we make this sort of programme with all this scrutiny, and I think everybody came to the opinion, you know, Philip didn't argue against it or anything, I think everyone felt it had come to a natural point. I where remember Philip's, the whole court appearance of Philip's brother, and yes. all of that whole thing was playing out just before all of this, mm. and there were lots of rumours that, you know, you know, about him as a result of his brother being in court and all the very awful things that emerged there. So I think the pressure on him was just enormous, actually. And on the 20th of May, when you said you look for, and you've sort of answered a bit of this, but you look forward to continuing our relationship uh, with Philip Schofield. Did his resignation from ITV days later take you by surprise? Yes, because he, it, was, it was completely due to the fact that he'd lied to us all this time. And he realised, I think, that it would be untenable to work with all these people that he'd been directly lying over years to us about. So he, I, I didn't have to make the decision about removing him from the, the, the instant thing was these soap awards that I mentioned, um, because he chose to step down and said, I'm, I'm, I'm actually leaving media completely. Um, but certainly he felt he couldn't really expect us to carry on employing him after he'd lied over such an important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just quickly take you back to the issue of runners? There are reports that this young man made his own showreel on the This Morning set at ITV's expense using all the production team that were in and around the set at that time, you know, after normal working hours. Is that a sort of facility that's made available to all runners? I think if requested, uh, 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 it would normally be granted. I think if suddenly there was a floodgate and 30 people were in a line saying, I want to do a showreel. But I think if you're, um, as we now know, uh, very friendly with the presenters, because in, in effect, it's... It's, it's a minimum, I think it was one camera or something, I don't, I don't know. But, it, but it's about having Philip and Holly um, prepared to stay on for 15 minutes afterwards to talk to you about, to do your showreel. So I think it's that. So it, it, this wouldn't be the first time. It was Philip, it was Holly, there was a cookery section, wasn't there? I mean, surely that this, must have, um, this must have been over and above the sort of support that ITV would have offered. Surely this shows some kind of preferential treatment. Well, I don't, none, none of us would have known that that showreel was being made. And I would say that it actually, uh, I've just said, I think runners are usually very ambitious. And they always, they will want to make their books. They will want to do their video reels. They will want to, they will want that because they want other jobs. And they want to show what they can do. And so um, I don't know of another instance, but I wouldn't know. I mean, it just wouldn't, mm. it wouldn't occur to me that, uh, you know, um, I mean, some, somebody else would do this. But it, I, I don't, I, I think the fact that he, most of it, as far as I saw, was a cut and paste of some other programmes. But he did interview Phil, and he did interview Holly, and he did interview Ruth and Eamon, um on, on this showreel. Um, and and I, I'm not sure that would have aroused in daytime much. I mean, if the head of daytime had been worried about that, she would have she would have done something about it. She'd have called him aside and said, what were you doing? Why were you doing it? That's company resources. I, th I think generally people are very encouraging of runners, they want them to do. They want them to do well. I to would be say. clear, this is a service that would be equally open to any other runners that were working on. Yes, it would morning. be. You'd have to get, you know, you'd, you'd get signed. It would be very informal, of course, and so you'd need the producer to agree, and and the crew, part whatever members of the crew you needed, they would have to agree, <coughs> and and in this case, Philip and Holly and uh, uh, Ruman and Eamon and Ruth would have would have had to agree. So, 
um, you, you'd be you'd have to be on pretty friendly terms or good terms or, or whatever to get everyone to say yes of course we'll hang around for 20 minutes and help you out but your question is would we do this for anybody else I think if 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 it, as long as it was not getting in the way of the show and we could help people whatever level they are um, to get their next role we, we would do that. We're very aware encouraging of any of that. other. You're not aware of any other runners who. Well, made I mean, them. we haven't looked, to be no. honest. We haven't might be worth asked. Adding to we your haven't inquiry. looked. Sure. Uh, thank you, Rupa. Uh, thanks, Chair, and hi everyone. Yeah, just sorry if I've missed this, but did uh, Philip Schofield have any role in helping the young man secure employment at ITV in the first place? So he introduced um, Person X into ITV. Um, Carla, do you want to do the date sequence of this sure, because sure. it's quite important and the age? Of course. So Person X um, first uh, got employment with, with ITV when, in 2016 when they were 20 years old. The previous year they had done some work experience. Um, uh, we we uh, now understand looking, looking back into it and having seen the Philip Schofield interview at the time or interview a couple of weeks ago, that um, he passed the, the person X asked for um, some work experience. Philip passed details of who to contact at ITV. The individual uh, filled in a form in the, in, the, in the normal way. To put this into context, we do about 250 work placements a year. There are about 50, 50 to 60 in daytime each year. The individual um, filled in that, that the connection was a family friend, that he was a family friend of Philip Schofield. No one thought anything of that. Um, many people put forward individuals who are family friends um, uh, for work experience. Uh, we will have a lot of that at ITV. Uh, he did his work experience at uh, age 19 for um, roughly two weeks. Um, he came back the following year and did some more uh, work experience and impress people. People thought, and I think anyone who has commented, who has known the individual who has commented over the, the last few weeks, I think everyone has said that he was an impressive individual um, and much liked and did a good job. He, was, he did well in his, his work placement and as with all runners who do well in the work placement, they're put onto, into what's called the runner pool, sort of a rota where if there are gaps or vacancies, they can be called upon to work on programmes. So he went in to the runner pool, which is not managed by any of the talent, it is managed by our production team um, and HR team, and uh, he was offered a short um, uh, contract when he was 20 in 2016, did well in that, and that became a longer term fixed contract with ITV. Because all of us get emails all the time from people wanting work experience and I mean I always say I only take paid staff so there is a, it's not what you know, it's who you know in the whole work well, experience to, to, field, No, it's, it? a, it's a really good point. We do a number of different things on work experience. We don't really want to do a lot, I mean altruistically we want to do a lot of work experience but actually it's quite a hard thing to do because you have to chaperone people who come in for... You have to chaperone people who come in for work experience, so it's intense on resources, and you have to do a good work experience programme. So this was 10 days uh, and will have, will have been done properly. Um, so you're absolutely right, because we all get these emails about work experience. We do work, just so you know, very formally. We have a very formal way of doing this as well. We work with Creative Access uh, so that we can give work experience to people from very, very different backgrounds, so that we get social mobility and we get diversity and we get you know a whole range of people that would not get opportunities because they would not know someone who would be able to do this. So uh, we do that. But in addition to that, in our, in our policy, it says you can, as, as someone who works at ITV, what you can do is just recommend, you can put them in with, to the right person. So there's a line manager that deals with it. And then if they can do it, they do it. And if they can't do it, they don't do it. So that, that, those are the two channels for work experience at ITV. Just something else you said um, is that sort of agents were involved. Just I'm trying to understand, is it YMU, the management company or something? Just what's their role in this? Because you told us when you were first aware of rumours swelling around and you started probing a bit. Would they, if they had been aware of concerns, would they have said anything or yes. are they a supplier that doesn't want to oh, fall no. out with they're ITV? Not no, they're not a supplier. Ke you? Kevin can explain this. Yes, so. that YMU is a large agency of mainly presenters and so forth um, and we've had a long working relationship with them. They 
it, it, sorry, is your, what, what's your question? If they, they knew what their they were... Their relationship work. with ITV. It's yeah, it's... Like, it's, they, it's, it's uh, would they embrace alarm bells or would they not want yes, to? Yes, they would. I think if they certainly would if they thought something surprising, underwater, or whatever. even a production company if there's such a yes, thing. Yes, they, they would show if there probably is. first off go to the producer of whatever show was relevant here because that would be their contact. That, that would be the producer in effect that shows the hiring of whoever is on screen. So they would have a, a regular contact with the producer. I mean, at a bigger level, uh, they might go to the head of entertainment or the head of daytime or, or me about what what's going on. So I think they you, you would like to think they if they knew of something they would have said it and and because we did speak to them a lot over this particular issue over the couple of years or whatever it was they and they just constantly denied it that anything untoward was going on and i think you know they made it very clear that they did not know anything in fact they they had lawyers working on behalf of philip to defend him because he had denied it to them so strenuously uh, and you were in a number of meetings with them, with the lawyers, because mm -hmm. we were asking them questions about what of, of Philip. So our relationship with them is they represent our presenters, and therefore we negotiate contracts with them. Um, but they don't supply us. I mean, they're not as they don't make programs. Me, they don't make programs. Um, and you've instructed a KC, so obviously you're taking it very seriously mm -hmm. to review the facts of this case. Mm -hmm. Are those uh, results going to be published in full so we can all see? The findings will be published. And just um, sort of, is that normal for your normal complaints procedure? How independent is your complaints procedure? I know from watching both Morning Show, which sometimes this saga feels like, and Succession, people kind of joke about, oh, internal investigations, mm. They can be used for many purposes. Can't that is they? TV. I'm afraid that's fiction. But True, anyway, but we'll, this we'll is get on like to the fiction facts. and faction and reality yeah, are all merging. Facts. Facts. So, so um, we take we take all complaints um, very seriously, whether they're raised informally or formally. Whether they're raised, we've got very clear grievance procedures and how things need to be handled, disciplinary procedures. So, if someone raises an issue internally. Um, uh, it will be assessed by HR. Um, Your own HR department or own, an independent, it, like this it, is a QC. It's in going in the first instance, just to, to ascertain the facts, if someone raises an issue and it's an HR related issue, our HR team will assess the facts. They will then work out whether it's, it's something that, um, where we need a, a, a formal investigation into it. If we have a formal investigation, depending on the facts, not in every case, but in many cases, what we will do is um, ensure that the investigating manager, so a senior manager within ITV, is brought in, but from outside the, the various, uh, outside the relevant department. So, for example, in one of the cases which has been widely covered in the media recently, um, where the individual was not named, but it's been widely covered that they raised issues about bullying and, and, and um, uh, inappropriate behaviours in the workplace. Um, the HR team called in uh, a senior uh, manager who actually was one of our news heads of news from elsewhere in the organisation to come in and be the independent uh, investigating person. And that they conducted, a, um, with HR support, they conducted a review into that particular case, looked at all of the allegations, looked at the documentation, uh, interviewed a raft of people, and in that case, I can say it hasn't been hasn't been said publicly, but uh, none of the allegations were upheld in that particular case. So in that case, we did it internally, but with an external, outside the relevant department, senior manager as the investigating manager. Um, in the case of Dr. Range, as Carolyn has said, um, we instructed an external um, HR company called HR Clarity. Um, who conducted an external investigation. We look at each situation and the facts as they, they stand and the um, uh, severity of the allegations that are swirling and decide whether it's more appropriate to do something internally or externally. So it's not one size fits all. Okay. And you mentioned Dr. Rand raised a complaint. Is it the same as the GMC, the um, Law Society, that BAME people get complained about more? than non-BAME people. I don't know if you've done these figures. Well, that's, but, um, just people Asian of colour complain more, do you yeah. mean? 
about. Uh, we've not I know you raised that. the complaint. I don't know if you know that. I don't, I don't know the statistics. I, I mean, given that, how many complaints have we so had? So can I, can I just say that over the last five years, we've looked at the statistics, we thought you might be interested in them. There have been 128 complaints. Uh, oh, actually, I think this is going to be coming to later. I was just interested in the BAME thing, if you want to. Well, now that I've started. Get so 128 oh, sorry. complaints. Um, uh, which have been investigated by our HR team either formally or informally across ITV across the last five oh, years. Yeah. And of those, um, five related to this morning, five of those complaints of the 128 across the last five years, and as we've said earlier, two of those related to um, bullying or harassment, and both of those have been discussed so far. Today. And just last one from me. Um, we know that um, Philip Schofield's previous co-presenter, Fern Britton, apparently left because she was paid £225,000 less than him. Is there differential pay that? for the same ro Gosh, role in your organisation? That's sort of 12 or 15 years ago, I think. Right, so everything's all better. I, I think you'll yes. find that everything has changed quite yeah. a lot. Yeah. So Philip and Holly on equal pay. pay. How Philip much and Holly it on depends the on the individual show. Could you just repeat that? What did you you just say? Yeah, I would say Philip and Ollie were on the same wage because they were doing the same job, uh, but probably not. Although it was a long time ago, not when they started, because she would have been junior and he was already well established, sort of thing. But but we um, we've made it a policy now that when people are clearly doing the same job, uh, like panelists on a show or something, uh, they should be paid uh, equally. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Rupa. Can I just quickly go back to the uh, KC review? If there's anything that um, Miss Mulcahy finds that's outside of the terms of reference that you've published, what will you do to ensure that these are appropriately treated? So uh, I'll just start and I hand over to Kyla. I, we've said really clearly there's a paragraph in the terms of reference that say if anything comes up that is not in scope, she will capture those and she will bring them to the attention uh, of the board. And once that review is concluded, depending on the findings clearly, uh, will, you, will you be potentially reviewing the position of any ITV staff? If, if Look, I think, uh, you know, we're taking the review, as you can see, extremely seriously. Um, you know, we wouldn't, have, uh, we wouldn't have initiated if it wasn't very serious. Uh, I, I would uh, say that we will listen to everything that's said, but I don't want to get into hypotheticals or preempt the KC review or, or, or prejudge it. How potentially might you hold people to account depending on these findings? Well, as I said, I think that depending on the findings, uh, <coughs> we will listen and we will learn and we will act. But I don't know what the findings are going to be, so I'm not going to go into a hypothetical situation that I don't know of yet. What other parameters are meant? I mean, worst case scenario? Would I, I don't want to talk about scenarios that? that we don't know yet, da um, Chair. I'm, I'm afraid that we would just be speculating as to what the findings are going to say. And, and the reason we've got a KC is to take away speculation and to look at the process, to look at the facts, to look at our approach, and then to come out with some findings. Uh, we, we, you know, she will be able to interview anybody that she wants. She will be able to, 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 to go anywhere she wants uh, uh, it, uh, with her terms of reference. And so there will be nothing to hide. And if, but if it was found that there was basically a cover-up at ITV this morning over this, people could be sacked? As I said, I don't want to get into hypotheticals because that is hypothetical currently. Uh, thank you very much and, um, and, and good, um, good morning, everybody. Um, can I just say what I don't think this is about? I don't think this is about whether Holly now hates Philip and whether Eamon's in the half with Holly and Kevin. That seems to me to be utterly irrelevant. I think it probably benefits ITV for, uh, for the tabloids to chase this particular hair uh, or that set of hairs. I think what this is about is about bullying and protection of staff. I think that's what the issue is and I think that's why we're here and that's why we want to talk to you about it. In that context, what did you feel, uh, Dame Carolyn, when you, after weeks of bullying headlines, you saw the editor of This Morning, Martin Frizzell, tell a reporter in answer to her question that he didn't like aubergines? I think you asked this of my colleague Magnus Brook, and I, did. I think he said it was ill-advised, and I couldn't agree with him more. I think uh, Martin has made a mistake. I think he knows he made a mistake. I think he didn't intend 
for it to come. I don't think he intended to say that, but I don't. Know. He did though. Yeah. He was looking. He was looking out the window. He saw there was a crew there. By the way, an ITV pool crew. There's been some speculation that he said that because it was a Sky crew, and but it was an ITV pool crew that he said that uh, to. He knew they were outside. He came out. He looked as if he thought he was coming out with a clever line. That's how he looked. Well, look, what I would say is that, you know, Kevin has actually spoken to him and he can talk to that. Um, I don't believe anything Martin said there in the heat of the moment uh, was reflective of our culture. I, I, I don't. He, I think why it matters, it, it matters not because it was, it was a ridiculous and absurd uh, and possibly vulgar thing to say. It matters because he's the boss of that programme. It's a programme that is mired uh, now with allegations of bullying. He knew that. And if you're a young staffer, before this whole stushy began, if you were a young staffer, he was the person that you'd go to if you're worried about bullying. I know you told us that you could respond anonymously, but he was the boss of that programme. That says a lot about the culture of that programme, that he took such a mocking and dismissive attitude towards bullying. Well, I'm, I think you're reading an awful lot into one comment, which was a foolish comment, I absolutely agree, and a very ill-advised comment, I absolutely agree. I, I, th I, I think to read into an entire culture of an organisation or a programme from one comment, from one person who probably was a bit under pressure, uh, regardless of the crew on his doorstep, he probably was. He is used to handling pressure, he should be able to handle it. He made a mistake. Right. Well, so, I'm not. So I'm he not, made a mistake. I'm not. Uh, if, if, that, if he had a saintly reputation, and there was no questions of bullying from anybody else, then you're right. Uh, that was just a, a single mistake. But like other members of the committee, I've had so many messages from folk at ITV who talk about the bullying culture of ITV. Now, it seems to me this morning, you've talked about loads of investigations, and they all seem to end up with ITV coming out smelling of roses. So I want to give a voice to a couple of people who've written uh, to me. I've done my very best to ascertain that these are real uh, people, either current or ex-staffers. I won't identify them in any way. Here's one. <clears throat> um, I worked for a boss at daytime, somebody senior. Uh, my boss was very difficult and would, as a matter of course, often shout and belittle staff. It went on for years with nobody doing anything about it. It was a toxic environment. That's one person. Here's another person. I'm very pleased to see your committee address the culture of bullying and toxicity at ITV. It's a terrible place to work. Daytime in particular is absolutely toxic. Here's how it works. If someone complains about bullying or sexual impropriety, ITV pretends to investigate They'll do a bit of a cursory glance at the complaint. Then they will answer, and they will, they will decide that there was no bullying. The person who complains is then ultimately forced to leave, often with a non-disclosure agreement. And it's made clear to them that they can't return to the work because they've made false accusations. So they're very disappointing to hear, deeply distressing, in my view, to I hear. Think dozens of them. Well, could you please hand those to us? I mean, I think that the, the I'm promised to do that because no, people, Mr. Mr. people are very concerned that the way that they write or little clues within their messages might identify you them. You just said they no longer work there. So. I, said, I said some did and some okay. did not. Well, the thing I have to say is that it is not something um, I recognise that characterises the whole culture at all. We've told you that we have had five complaints in five years on daytime, um, and we have taken all of them seriously, and only two <coughs> of them were about bullying uh, and uh, any any kind of kind of question around discrimination of, of role. So what how I would say- How come people are so unhappy? How come people are so- I'll let you come back in. How come people are so unhappy, and so many people are unhappy, and yet you keep doing investigations which keep ending up showing that there wasn't a problem. So can I just say, if we don't know, if we don't know of these, I've said we've had two official complaints. <coughs> Both of them were investigated, one internally, which Kyla has explained how we did that, 
and one was not investigated internally, deliberately, so that we could find out what was independently, that the person who did that had absolutely no involvement in ITV. They were an HR specialist, and they were not able to up uphold the allegations. So I think what I'm saying to you is, it's not loads of investigations. We have investigated whenever we've had a complaint, uh, and we take it very, very seriously. It does not fill me with anything but just sorrow, really, and, and sadness. I, I am, I've never, you know, it's not something that we try and instill or foster. It is the antithesis of what we want. So if you are getting many people calling you, I honestly feel there is a confidential way that you can let them speak to us because that's the way we can actually look at this properly and do something about it. We will do something All about right, it. All right, I'll ask them. Yes, please. Okay, because I'll, uh, I can't do anything right. if they're telling you about it I'll ask because them. I run ITV. I'll ask them, though I, I, I think there's a trust issue. Well, not, I don't think, I, I genuinely think that if there is a trust issue within daytime, which you're trying to describe, which I, you know, because you have knowledge that I don't, because you've been talking to people, then there are other ways that they can talk to us that don't betray any trust issues with, with, with daytime. We'll so, happily give you the details of safe call to pass on to them if you, if, if you feel comfortable doing that, Mr. Nicholson, so that um, that's the external confidential, it can be anonymous helpline. And also, as we look into these, if there's anything that needs to go into the KC review, we will be passing it on. All right. Um, now, Dame Caroline, this morning you've talked about the ways in which ITV talked to Mr X um, about the situation, ITV. And I've written down, you've, you've called it um, a review twice, I think, and an investigation once. I've never called it an investigation. I actually said to the I chair, heard you say that, but then you subsequently used the word I said, investigate. I might have said investigated, because I think what we do is that we did investigate, but I, I wouldn't call it an investigation, because that gives it a kind of formality and, and, and structure that, because of the rumours and because of the time period, it didn't have. Okay. I, I've spoken to someone who's, who's friendly with uh, Mr X, um, uh, who says that he felt that the uh, review, uh, the investigations that took place um, made it quite difficult for him to talk and he was under a, a lot of pressure not to talk. Um, he quotes one particular conversation with a manager and um, the words used were, is everything okay between you and Philip? Those were the words used. And he didn't, I'm told, feel that he could really answer that with any candor uh, because, well, for all the reasons that we understand. Um, he also, I'm told, feels that uh, he left the programme um, and didn't want to. Now, I've heard a number of different people describe his move to Loose Women as a promotion that he applied for. Uh, can you confirm that uh, of his own volition he applied for this job and that his job there was a promotion Okay, can I, I'll just go back to some of the things you've just, um, dis you've just outlined. Um, difficult to talk was he was under pressure not to talk. So we'd need to understand from whom, because in every conversation he's had with the head of production, he has actually not only felt less pressure when talking to her, because she has been so supportive and helpful of him. Well, Philip Schofield didn't want him to reveal to but, anybody but that, but that, the relationship. But, but that's a very different issue that's a very different matter saying Philip didn't want him and I don't know the, I don't know whether that's true or not I don't know because I will I, I, I don't have that information but if Philip was putting him under pressure ITV were not putting him under pressure uh, on anything we were actually asking he was coming to us for uh, counseling and for other things and we were helping him to be able to talk freely to us without anybody else in the organisation, right. even knowing about it. So I want to apply for a job at Loose Women. I come on to that, but I want to be very clear that it's Philip that was putting him under pressure and not ITV that was putting him under pressure because they're two quite separate things and it's very important we stick to facts here. And the fact of the Loose Women uh, issue is that he absolutely applied for that job and he got it and it was a promotion. But if we just track back, he actually applied for a job on this morning as a researcher and Kyla will give you the dates 
before he applied for Loose Women, and he didn't get the job on this morning. He went through a recruitment process, he didn't get the job. He then applied for a job on Loose Women with 29 other applicants in the process, and he got the job. And I think we have to remember, we're talking about person X, it's very hard to know. He was an extremely capable, very confident young person. He really was, and he was, he, he, impressed people he came across. So he was ambitious. And okay, he, I, you've, and he, you've said that about his ambition before, and I take that point. Anyway, I'm just relating to you that his friend has told me that he didn't actually want to, to leave, and uh, indeed that somebody was, uh, somebody was removed from uh, loose women in there order to no get them the There is no evidence for us. We have looked at the process, we have looked at the procedure, we have looked at the line manager who interviewed him, and we have looked at the other applicants. So, right. I mean, we have looked into this in 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 the allegations that there are out there, um, and our HR teams have absolutely confirmed, as Carolyn has outlined, this was in twenty. 19 to get my dates right 2019 that he applied for a transfer he was looking for a promotion my understanding it's not i mean kevin is much, obviously much closer to uh the world of production and, and runners but people don't become a runner to be a runner for life no, of course. you're a runner and you look for I, and, I understand a promotion that. I, and this was a promotion production secretary is a promotion if you don't mind let's whiz on a wee bit because sure. we've a lot to get through my uh I've spoken to a number of different people at, at the programme, uh, current and, and former employees. They say it was a bit of an open secret what was going on between him and Philip Schofield. People knew about it, you know, the, the showreel that the chair described obviously isn't a normal thing uh, to, to, to happen. Uh, we, we know that. I've worked in TV. Most rare for a runner to be afforded that kind of time and privileged access. Um, did, when, when he was hired, did anybody find out um, what his history was with Philip Schofield. Did he check when Philip Schofield first met him, which, as you know, was when he was very young? Did anybody discover that Philip Schofield had followed him on social media when he was very young? Did anybody look into that or notice that? Or has that all been a surprise to you? So why don't, why don't I take that? Um, no, no one looked into No one looked into the detail at the time. As I say, this was an individual, one of... 50 to 60 work placements um, on daytime um, when he, he came for one and a half weeks work experience, uh, noting that um, Philip Schofield was a family friend. There were no alarm bells. There was nothing to see in that. We will have many um, uh, similar uh, applications for work experience where, where someone lists family friend across ITV. So, no, no one looked back uh, And we that. wouldn't do that, Mr Nicholson, for any uh, work experience person. We wouldn't look into background. We would either give them work experience or we wouldn't be able to give them work experience because we couldn't do it. And so he was 19 and fully supervised through his time there. Do you know who's paying for his, his lawyer at the moment? Because press reports are that Philip Schofield's paying for the lawyer. My understanding is that Philip Schofield is paying for it. I think Philip mentioned that in the BBC interview, but we don't get involved in that. My understanding is that that's not true. His, his lawyers are working uh, pro bono because they're concerned about some of the issues in the case. Um, but you've been in touch with him recently. Person X. Yes. Or Philip Schofield. No, Person X. Yes. Um, can I just check how many people approach senior management with concerns about presenters, editors, or the culture at this morning. Uh, can I turn to you, uh, Mr. Ligo, about this? What came to me directly with complaining about behavior or something? Yeah. Um, I don't think any that I can recall, honestly. Well, that's funny, because I have a, a copy of uh, an email, um, and it says, I understand it, uh, it's from ITV, uh, referring to you. In our meeting the Monday the 4th of October 2021, uh, you referred uh, to your concerns about the conduct of Philip Schofield and another co uh, colleague working on this morning. Um, I'm not able to share all the details, uh, but I can find no evidence to suggest that uh, Kevin Ligo failed to take action on the allegations that you have raised with him. Um, it's not a question of him not being interested in the concerns. He is interested in the concerns, and he does take 
the allegations that you have raised seriously. So here's an example of somebody who did contact you. Can't tell you who it is without permission. Okay, well... But this is an email from ITV. Someone at ITV yeah. to me. Somebody senior at ITV to the person who made the complaint. I know, someone from, your, your, from you, right. someone for, for you, to the complainant. Yeah. Okay, well, I, we'll need to see that. I'll need to check that, sorry. Okay, because um, that seems quite significant. Um, we've talked about non-disclosure agreements a, a number of times uh, today, and you've confirmed that Mr X has not been asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Right. Though he was given a, a payoff, wasn't he? I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterise it as a payoff. His role was made redundant. Um, and, and he... Is he staff? After lockdown. He was a, a fixed-term contractor, so staff. We treat them in exactly the same way he'd been on fixed-term contracts for throughout his time at is that, ITV. Is that normal to give normal payoffs to folk who are non-staff? It's normal at ITV. It was an absolutely standard um, process. I, I have spoken to our, our chief people officer who has confirmed that. Um, his um, uh, settlement agreement that he entered into was completely standard. There is a very clear carve out for whistleblowing speaking up and the payment, I understand, was absolutely standard, formulaic as we would have paid to anyone else at that time. It was level. a redundancy. It was a redundancy Because his role situation. was redundant post-COVID. Okay. Um, yesterday, the BBC said to us that um, they were going to release people from non-disclosure agreements that they'd signed in the past, unless it was specifically to do with commercial confidentiality. Are ITV prepared to do the same? I think we haven't. Well, to the extent, I mean, to the extent that there are uh, non-disclosure agreements that were entered into historically, I don't know what, where those would be or, or what period of time, um, then yes. I mean, we don't, we have no, at the moment, I would have no knowledge of an NDA other than for commercial matters. Um, so, so other than commercial matters, at the IT moment, I don't have any, no I okay. have no knowledge that we have signed NDAs. If, if we have anything historically that we don't know about, we will look into that, but we would have no reason, I think, to sign NDAs. Were you saying something a bit more cautious than Ms Mullins? Because Ms Mullins a second ago said, yes, people would be released from those, and you are saying so that you'd look into it. Yeah. Is it look into or release? No, really, both. I mean, we need to find out if there are any. Right, but I've, I've phrased my question carefully. We're not talking about commercial. Uh, uh, NDEs yeah. with commercial sensitivity, yeah. um, just NDEs that, for example, might refer to uh, payoffs for bullying or other matters like that. Well, can, can I say, we, let's be clear about this. We don't have any contracts uh, that would say that they couldn't speak up about bullying or harassment or sexual uh, harassment or anything like that. We, 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 that there is, Kylo already referred to this, there is yes. a carve out that is, is quite clear in, in any agreement, that a standard agreement that we would do. Good. And just to go back to, uh, to my previous question, Mr. Ligo, I'll ask for permission to send you uh, that, yes, yes. that email. But just for the record, you're saying that to the best of your recollection, you had no meetings with anybody where they talked about uh, bullying culture or inappropriate behaviour with regard to Philip Schofield. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty certain I would, I would remember if they were talking about... Well, I would have thought so. Um, i just ask one final um, question. Can you confirm that daytime production staff at this morning referred to their audience in production meetings as Tower Block Tracys? As what, sorry? Tower Block Tracys. I've never heard that phrase. I have no. never heard that. A number of people have told me that. I've never heard that. Seems I don't even truly dismissive. If an idea is regarded as too highbrow, well, um, I've told people say, would that really appeal to the Tarbot Tracys? I, I agree. It's, never heard that. It's a horrible I, thing to I, 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 yeah. A horrible thing to say. It's it's not what ITV would be looking at as a target audience, right? We we wouldn't describe our target audience in that way. And I know that. I do know one thing, which is that the daytime team on every show really cares about the audience, so that surprises me. Sure. Thank you, John. Can I just go back a little bit? Are staff ever involved in, um, uh, are, are your on-screen talent ever, or presenters 
ever able to have staff moved <coughs> from roles or jobs? You mean, do you mean removed? Yeah, or? yeah. So say, so, um, yeah, can, can, are staff ever moved on from roles within ITV at the request of presenters or other on-screen talent? I, I don't know of an instance, but I suppose it's, it is possible that if a producer or a presenter found somebody very difficult or awkward or something, they might say, I'm finding it very difficult to work with that person, and then maybe an appropriate action will be taken. But I don't, I don't know of an example. Any examples? And would that ring any alarm bells? No. Okay. Uh, Sam? Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning. I want to talk more generally, not talking about any specific case, because I think we've covered that ad nauseum this morning about the training that ITV provides its managers on safeguarding and managing complaints. As a former ITV manager myself, I remember within weeks of being employed, put on a safeguarding course. I can't pretend I remember all of the course now. It's been several years. But could you outline the training that is provided and how far that training is provided amongst managers? Because obviously I worked in news. There's entertainment, there's factual, there's so many different departments. Yeah. How widespread is that safeguarding training? It's widespread. So, um, I mean, the first thing to do is training is important. We do it both online, we do it offline, and we do it on the job. So there are three, we see it as three different types of training, because sometimes on the job training is uh, more valuable in some ways than filling in online forms, mandatory training. So. Do you want to talk a little bit about the process? Yeah. So, so our, our, our general process, when um, anyone joins ITV, they um, do mandatory training. There is very specific training around our code of conduct, so we're very, very clear what the expectations of individuals are. And then that training then takes place annually. Every year, it's mandatory for everyone um, who is at ITV. It's not purely on the code of ethics and conduct, um, it's on other key policies that we have to try and make sure that people are up to date, they're focused on it. We also have a very extensive awareness program, not just around um, our, our um, uh, specific policies, but around speaking up. So we, we, and we train our managers, we have specific uh, training for our managers to make sure that they know how to handle complaints if they come into them directly Obviously, our HR staff are co continually trained um, in that, and my legal team also are, are trained on a regular basis on what to do if complaints come in. We brought in a director of corporate compliance and ethics two years ago to, to oversee all this, this entire program mm. to make sure that we, it, it's given the focus and the training and the traction that we get the traction that we really need. Did you say it was yearly? So there's the yearly refreshers? Yes, man. It's and man how long has that been the case? Oh, gosh. I don't have that detail, but certainly, certainly for the last five, five years, years, if not. Yeah, so just to clarify then, if you if you join ITV, yes. what level of, of management get to do the, this training? All staff. All staff. All staff. All staff, okay. And if anyone does, doesn't do it, then that should be flagged and HR follow up. Okay, and that's obviously, that because you have so many sites across the country, um, how much of that is virtual and how much is that in person? I remember my training course being in person. Well, certainly, a lot. So a lot of it is virtual. We do both, as Carolyn said. There, it's a multi-pronged attack. But certainly, the mandatory training, it's online. It can be tracked. People are are notified. We used to do it in one fell swoop, and it'd be several hours of mandatory training. We've decided this year that actually, that is quite a lot for anyone to do and to really absorb and engage appropriately with. So we're now splitting the mandatory training modules across the year. So there are several to do every couple of months. And it's tracked online, so we track who is doing it, who has missed a deadline, they're reminded, there is follow-up, and we make it clear that if, so, if people do not complete their uh, mandatory training, that it could end up being a disciplinary matter. Has anyone not completed their mandatory training and then ended up with a disciplinary issue? I don't have that, that detail. Certainly what I do know is that there are regular uh, because my team work very closely with HR, for, for the, um, those offenders who have, have missed a deadline, there are very targeted and individual reminders, and we also get the line manager involved now to make sure. So whether this was, uh, 
ex uh, apologies, I, I'm not sure when you were involved at ITV, but whether this was in your day or what we're doing now, as we said earlier, this is evolving. We're always looking for best practice and new ways um, to make sure that people actually really absorb and, and this traction around our policies. And just to build on that, Simon, there's also some things that are very specific to news, which will be amplified in news, very specific to dramas that have children not working on them, or disability, for instance. Uh, you know, we've had a drama which, is, which had two disabled stars in it. The safeguarding requirements on those would be amplified and bespoke to those. So it, there is mandatory generalised training, but also quite specific on production, depending on the kind of production. Without wanting to go back on the, the, the substance of the, the, of the previous part of this um, session this morning, obviously you've got a KC reviewing all that, I don't want to go into it, but do you think there could be lessons to learn that could be used to enhance the training you provide off the back of this review? Look, I, I think we've been, I hope we've been very open with you that we don't have any complacency we don't think we do everything right. You know, we have learned enormously f on duty of care, how to refine, upgrade, enhance, develop, and we will continue to do that. And I think this is a similar situation, which is we will listen and we will absolutely learn and act uh, if anything emerges uh, from the findings. And uh, undoubtedly, there will be things to learn. If there were findings there, for example, that felt that, felt that there were you know, pitfalls and problems that you hadn't seen before, would you then perhaps bring forward a refreshing training course for people? Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Thank you very much. Can I just talk to you a little bit more broadly about some of the other programmes that uh, ITV is uh, responsible for? How do you respond to the allegations made by Rebecca Ferguson regarding the treatment of contestants who appeared on The X Factor? Could you just repeat the question? I didn't hear the middle of it. How do you respond to the allegations made by Rebecca Ferguson oh, regarding the treatment of contestants on the X Factor? Okay, I mean, look, I, the, the first thing I want to say is we'll take, we take her allegations. They go back to 2010 or 2011. Um, we take, we obviously would take that seriously. We are uh, the broadcaster of that. So a lot of what we've been talking about, about shows that we make, uh, and a lot of our training, etc., is all about shows that we make. Um, the, there is another company involved in making the X Factor, and I'll just hand over to Kevin, and then maybe you can come in on Rebecca. Sure. Yes, remember when, you know, as a broadcaster, we commission shows um, from third parties as well as from our own, uh, our own production arm. Um, but, and so, you know, we, we impose kind of very tight restrictions, the same as we would on our own um, production companies uh, on things like duty of care and, and, and all that aspect of it. There's, here is our duty of care file in case anybody would like to see it. It's many pages long. Um, uh, so that would have been back then, I assume, you know, part of the contractual obligations. But on the, on the ground, it's up to the producer, really, on a day-to-day -day basis to check that everything that we've required for them to do is being done. We would follow up with spot checks, we'd uh, have a debrief after the show and everything, but um, whilst the show is in production, it's got to be the preserve of the production company, whether it's ours or whether it's a third party. On Rebecca Ferguson, I, d I, I wasn't there, I don't know the detail. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I think it's also fair to say that our uh, duty of care requirements of third party producers has uh, increased significantly since 2019. So we have a completely different way of dealing with third-party producers on duty of care now than we did in 20, before 2019-2018. Yeah. Um, so uh, Rebecca Ferguson did raise um, uh, some issues with us in 2021. She did refer to her time, and bearing in mind this dated back to, to 2010, um, and she had various complaints about how she and other individuals, other participants on the X Factor were, were treated and handled. Uh, we, uh, my legal team immediately got in touch with Fremantle Thames, the producer, because they are the people who will have entered into contracts with all of the participants. We ITV don't. We, we, we enter into a contract with Fremantle for the show. We don't enter into a contract with any of the participants. But we raised all of the issues with them. Um, they responded to all of those. And I think the, the key message was that um, actually the issues where, where Rebecca Ferguson was suggesting that things needed to change, there needed to be a different approach to the music how the music industry 
deals with, with young people um, entering record contracts and how companies like Fremantle run things, there was confirmation on pretty much, I think, every point that she raised that actually things had moved on and moved on quite significantly and that um, they took the duty of care very seriously and there had been changes in the, um, in the industry. That was passed back to Rebecca. Um, and so when she then said, well, are we going to investigate this? Our response, and I know it's been, it's been quoted that we refuse to, to, to um, launch an investigation. I think uh, we believe genuinely that we had, having dealt, having spoken to the, the record company, having, sorry, the, the production company, and having been very clear that all of the points where she felt that there needed to be improvements, there genuinely were, and passed that back, that there was nothing really for us as the broadcaster to, um, to investigate. And one other point, just uh, which I have, have referred to, we didn't enter into any contract. We have not at any stage entered into any contract with Rebecca Ferguson or any of the other participants in that show. ITV wouldn't do that. So when, when she talks about releasing of NDAs or other contracts, we, we are not the party to those. But when Sarah Clark, the Chief Operations Officer, responded yes. to Rebecca Ferguson, she ref refused to meet her and she refused to launch any kind of probe into how talent was treated at ITV when Re Rebecca was a, was a... Do you not think that there's a... Do you not think there's, there's a kind of arrogance in sort of dismissing her concerns and saying, we've dealt with this, there's nothing to see here, and in actual fact, this was one of our independent contractors anyway, so it wasn't really our responsibility. I mean, that to me seems a, an unbelievable. I think we've said that, um, Chair. I, don't, I, I honestly don't think that's our attitude to this. No one, met, no one even we've met We've worked with, Rebecca, with Fremantle, did we, but, but, but we replied, we asked, Fre we asked the producer to deal with it, just as we would deal with it as a producer on behalf of the broadcast. The broadcast is broadcasting the show, and as Kevin says, you know, we now particularly have very strict requirements on duty of care. In, in 2010-11, you know, Fremantle would have been dealing with that. They would have been dealing with that day to day. And so Sarah Clark put that through to Fremantle because they're the producer and said, I mean, actually, if Rebecca was going to meet with anybody, it should have been Fremantle. And, they, and they're still alive and well. Yes, and if I could, if I could also say that was the, the response to the second um, uh, email for, or, or, or letter from Rebecca Ferguson. The first letter, which raised various points, was, was responded to in detail, with input, obviously, as I've said, from Fremantle. So it was responded to in detail when Rebecca came back to say, but should you not launch an investigation? That's when Sarah responded, uh, really, to say, I don't think an investigation is appropriate here. We've responded to all of these these issues, and things have clearly moved on. So I don't think it was in any way to be dismissive of Rebecca Ferguson or any of the issues that she has. Without an investigation, how can you be 100% clear what the issues were and whether things have entirely moved on? I mean, you're just taking Fremantle's word for it, aren't you? We didn't feel that it, there was something for ITV as the broadcaster to investigate. But she actually outlined, I, I understand, yes. from the first her first email, all the issues that she identified. And so we could say, against every issue, she identified what had been done on duty of care in the industry, not just simply at ITV. Does ITV monitor individual programmes and production sets as part of your compliance with the duty of care charter, yes. regardless of yes, whether they're yes, independent or in-house production. Yes. Okay. And is that something that's changed since? Uh, I think that has changed expected. quite uh, a lot since 2018. I mean, we always did that. I mean, I, mm. you can talk better to this, but I mean, there would have always been spot checks. There would have always been people on the ground. But I think what we do now is systematic, from selection to production to post-production. It's systematic, and it's written down. We have a duty of care charter. We have a mental health advisory group. We have um, we have uh, uh, two medical professionals who work for us, both retained. Um, we have an external advisor. We have Dr. Sandra Scott who works on shows every day. So we have a huge, comprehensive process of duty of care, and it's systematic. And what, um, are you aware of any other potential safeguarding issues concerning any other current or recent ITV shows or presenters? No, not to my knowledge. No, not to my knowledge. No. And what would you say to the family of Caroline Flack who've stated that ITV used its talent like commodities? 
I think the first thing we'd say is that we feel, I mean, we genuinely feel deeply, deeply sad about what happened to Caroline. I mean, pe people kn knew her well at ITV. This is not, this is not something that I, c I can actually talk about that because I've spoken to a lot of people at ITV that worked with her and really liked working with her. And she loved, they loved working with her on the show because the show was, she, she loved the show. So the, that's the first thing I would say. I, I, I think, you know, the family are obviously grieving. Um, I, I, I would say we don't ever feel, we, we never feel that we would treat anybody like a whether it's a presenter or a member of staff or a, or a, junior, per, a junior person that's coming in for work experience, we would treat no, we would really not want to treat anyone like a commodity. Do, do you want to? Yeah, I think with Caroline, the, um, in that instance, she, because of things going on in her private life, she said, I don't want to, I don't think I'm fit to do the next series of Love Island. And we said, OK, we understand that. And made, but made it very clear that it was her show. We would get a stand in, but then she could come back uh, when she wanted to because she hadn't done anything wrong in our eyes. So I, I, I think we were offering her work and all the rest of it. So, I, I, you know, I didn't, we, nobody would agree that we treated her as a commodity. Is, is um, ITV completely unique in the UK in that it has a show that's now linked to four suicides, let alone that's a show that's still running on your channel as we speak? So, so uh, I think that's a gross misrepresent misrepresentation of the show because, uh, and let, let me break that down, uh, Caroline was not on the show and, and the reason um, that she very, you know, tragically uh, took her life I think it's it, she, she, it was very she had a very she was going through some extremely public things in her private life so I don't think you can just correlate and say bang you know this is because she's on a show uh, I think there were two other that I'm aware of um, that you might be referring to um, and uh, I think one of the things I would say is that these are you know deeply tragic things deeply I mean no one wants to see anyone whatever age take their own life we've thought about it a huge amount you know as I said I, I don't think any of you know, can even understand how deeply distressing something like that would be for people who work on uh, who work at ITB um, we've I've, I've really looked at this in you know in some detail with, with, with our you know not just with Kevin and Kyla and others but with people internally um, and, and we've actually taken a lot of professional advice. We've talked to professional advisors. And I think the generally accepted professional opinion is that the causes of the tragedies, of these types of tragedies, are always complex and multiple. And both individuals you're referring to um, took their lives two years after they appeared on a show. And, and, I, and there will have been many, many other events which will have been part of multiple causes. We work with CALM, the Campaign Against Living Miserably. Uh, we work with MIND and Young Mind. They're, uh, they're both on our mental health advisory group. And they would say that, to, uh, and I'm quoting, I, I think they would say to isolate one event, albeit an important, maybe an important event in their lives, is to really simplify a very complex sequence of events. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 I feel that when you throw that at us, you know, it is, it is a, a very difficult for us uh, and it, it, it makes us sound unfeeling and we're really, really not, we take it so seriously. Mm -hmm. As I've said since 2018, the duty of care uh, on every show, but Love Island particularly, is extremely comprehensive and we're very happy to leave you the file of duty of care so that the committee can see the lengths we go through to protect both participants on the show but also our staff on the show. I mean, I'm grateful for that, but I would not be doing my job properly if I were not questioning sure. you about your duty of care to of either contestants or employees. I'm happy to answer it. And finally, um, the share price has gone down by 60% since you started as the CEO, uh, Dame Caroline. Why do you think that is? I think that is because we've had um, COVID, where our share price went down dramatically because we were taking no income. 
uh, advertising halved and no productions were taking place for quite a long time. We then recovered from that and we then invested £200 million into our streaming service, ITVX. The share price went down as a result of that and it had double whammied because it also uh, was the fifth day of the uh, awful invasion of Ukraine. We are not the only company in the UK, particularly in, in not just in media, there's no comparable media organisation, but RTL's share price has gone down roughly the same, ProSieben in Europe has gone down roughly the same, the streamers have gone down even more, um, and so I think the relativity of your point is the most important thing rather than trying to um, not see it in the context of the market that we're operating in with the cost of living, which is also depressing advertising. And so there is an advertising recession, even though there's not an economic recession. And I think the committee knows only too well that ITV gets no funding from anybody other than from advertising and content. And so therefore, if there's an advertising recession, that will also be weighing heavily on our share price. Yes, but, but despite that, you were reportedly paid more than three and a half million pounds last year. That's a 7% increase on your previous package. Are you being rewarded for failure? I, I don't think we're failing. That's the first thing I would say. I don't see how you would sit there and say that ITV is a failing company. We had two years of record profit in 2022 and 2021. We made more advertising revenue in a, in a, in a really challenging market when linear audiences are declining. Um, so we're not a failing company. We make a lot of profit. Uh, we want to return more money to shareholders, but we have invested in our future by launching ITVX. Uh, we have other plans to make ITV an even stronger company going forward. We have had to invest in technology, in data and in digital capability, which we have done. I think most people that you would talk to in the advertising world and also in the business world would actually see ITV as a successful company who is navigating and transitioning to the digital world very effectively. What's more important to you, commercial revenue or treating people fairly? Treating people fairly. So despite your increased pay, your staff received an average 3% increase in the face of inflation. Okay, so this uh, is, can I just check? that's fair? Chair, I really think you have to do the facts because the 3.4 million includes a long-term incentive plan which has not been earned yet. So it's part of a package. Uh, and so my base salary is actually uh, under a million pounds and I get a short-term bonus and I get a long-term bonus if criteria are met. The other thing I would like to do is just ask you to look at the report and accounts where the remuneration policy is completely outlined. The rem I don't set my salary, the, remuner the remuneration committee do, and so I would ask you to look at that and we're very happy to give you our report and accounts. Do you think you should keep your job? I do, and I, I think that most people, I mean, I, I, I do. Thank you. That concludes today's question. And can I thank all of you for appearing in front of us today? I hope that you all and everybody that's uh, been watching this goes away with the very strong message that today has not been about Philip Schofield, it's not been about Person X, it's been very much about ITV as an employer and as an institution. Uh, I would like to hope that some of the answers that you've given today provide some form of reassurance to people working for ITV and those who, through no fault of their own, have left the organisations and that the issues that they've raised have been taken seriously. But I am slightly concerned that you're waiting for the results of the, um, of the investigation before taking any action to improve the working environment. There's clearly some work for ITV to do here to rebuild trust with with us but with its its staff more, more importantly its staff and with its viewers that it's a safe and welcoming workplace uh, we want to be really confident that ITV has the processes and the people in place to meet its duty of care and to deal appropriately with complaints we want to be confident that ITV is not letting star power and favoritism damage the lives and careers of people working there and more, more importantly than that, we want to be confident that where mistakes have been made, ITV will be making changes rather than making jokes about 
aubergines. We'll be watching very closely to see whether you achieve this. Well, order, I don't know order. if I'm allowed to say anything at the end of this to what you've just said, but I think in, in, in every single thing that we've said, we've told you we've taken this seriously, and it has been about Philip Schofield and, the, and Person X. We've spent an awful lot of time talking about that, and that is absolutely fine. But I think that we are... Um, we are taking. We will take every allegation about uh, uh, our culture seriously. But I think it would be very wrong to depict ITV as having an issue on that. I think it would, you know we have given you a whole load of tangible evidence that we take it very seriously. That we will listen. That we will act. And we will not wait for the KC. You know we will be doing as we always do. We'll be looking at everything that we do, and we will be trying to improve it. Um, and thank you very much for listening to us. Um, and giving us the opportunity to put some facts straight. Thank you. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.